Yeah. Well, I think this, this is a good illustration of where a really, really tiny number of people can make a big noise. Uh, so this is sort of something called the Birkbeck Students Anti-Racism Network. And what it is, is essentially a Twitter feed. Uh, and, and I'm not sure exactly who's behind it, but every six months or a year, they kind of go off on a tirade against me. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> And so they've actually done the Kaufman out thing on a number of occasions, but this most, most recent time, they sort of tried to pin together a whole bunch of what they thought were their strong points and, and fling it at me with the, with the Kaufman out hashtag. And, you know, they got a, a few hundred likes from within their, their very narrow kind of radical activist community. But what was interesting is how badly ratioed they got on Twitter. And then, and that, that even in, in the press, for example, even in the Guardian, which you, you might have thought might be the only outlet that might support them, even there they were criticized, you know. So, I mean, you know, some of the things that they were mentioning, essentially being against what they called anti-racism, right, which of course is, is a sort of uh, a fig leaf for essentially radical, any kind of radical activism that claims to be in the name of anti-racism. It could be about microaggressions, it could be about use of certain words, it could be about just being a conservative, you know, anything like that. Uh, if you're against anti-racism, you are therefore a, a legitimate target to use IRA language. Um, and so <laughs> this was sort of behind it. And they were they were suggesting that the fact that I'd written for really, but a really kind of centrist mainstream publications like Unheard, uh, the or 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 um, the fact that I worked with Policy Exchange of the mainstream largest think tank in the UK happens to be conservative aligned, but that sort of made me part of, you know, essentially the other. Um, so, so their conception of who is a racist is really broad. Um, yeah, so they kind of tried to make a, a big go of it. And I think they were pretty humiliated uh, because it's sort of like the bubble colliding with reality, you know, and people could sort of see into their little world of, of, of what is considered racism in their narrow world. So yeah, I thought that was, and I was very appreciative of, of Ferguson uh, going to bat for me. Absolutely. Amazing. You know, and, and I, I read through um, that Twitter feed this week and I, and I have to say, unless I have missed something, all it looks to me is that it's just a group of, as you say, radical students that are angry about someone that really simply just doesn't share their views. And uh, there was nothing in there, you know, in my opinion, to, I mean, uh, really, I looked at it and I thought, you've, you've wasted your, your precious oxygen typing a lot of this stuff out, you know, right. but uh, I was wondering, what, what was the sort of response being from uh, Birkbeck? Have they paid any heed in to it at all? Yeah, so this is really interesting because you, you know, typically the modus operandi of these people is to raise a stink, embarrass, try and make the university think that their reputation is in danger and therefore the university will cave in. And that's often what happens. I mean, the case of Neil Thin up in uh, University of Edinburgh right. where he criticized this decision to change the name of David Hume Tower. Uh, and suddenly the students attacked him, put in a formal complaint, got him suspended from teaching. And in other places, you know, even some people have been fired for this. So in many cases, you know, universities will in fact cave in. And these, this, I don't know if it's this group or people affiliated with them have put in formal complaints against me before, which, which are you know psychologically taxing simply because there's there's a big unknown factor as to where this is going to go. Um, so Birkbeck itself has been uh, pretty good. I mean, they haven't reacted to this. Um, I think the, the it, you know the top layers of Birkbeck University are are pretty pretty sound. I think in free speech terms, the students also. The, you know, Birkbeck students tend to be evening students. They're a bit older. Um, generally, you know, the, the vast, vast majority have, have no interest in these sorts of things. And I've never had an issue in class, for example. Um, so it is really a small group using that name and they don't really seem to have much clout. Uh, but what I will say is there are academics within the university who are sympathetic to these people. Not many, there's a handful. Uh, and there's certainly a body of radical left opinion, which is sort of behind, uh, maybe not canceling, but certainly sympathetic to the technique of inflating the meaning of terms like racism and, and harassment uh, to include things which are not racist or, or harassing. Uh, even just writing for conservative publication makes some people feel unsafe. You know, that sort of reasoning is, is there. 
but it's a minority uh, who hold those beliefs. The one thing I would say though is we're in a very interesting policy context in Britain because the academic freedom uh, legislation and white paper has now come through. I mean, it still has to go formally get passed in parliament, but uh, it's appeared in the Queen's speech. What the message, you know, the message there is very clear, which is that um, free speech has to come first and these other obligations uh, to, to the extent they're important come second. So you can't use an inflated claim of harassment to try and shut down, uh, you know, to shut down somebody's academic freedom. And, and because the government's been pretty strong on that, I think universities have got the message and you can see it in a number of places where universities have backed off now where maybe in the past they would have bent to the uh, social justice activists. So I think that's very positive and I think shows kind of a way forward. But in Scotland, there aren't the same protections and you can see that there's a difference. In Scotland, the academics are much more vulnerable. Whereas I think in England, now with these new protections, uh, academics can breathe a lot easier.